Good morning. Welcome back to another self-isolating bird club broadcast. We're here in our home in the New Forest. It's a little bit chilly when the sun goes in. I'm kind of regretting not wrapping up. I feel like I need a puffer or, a, or one of them. Yes, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been out uh, early this morning obviously, with the poods in the woods um, when the sun was shining. It was lovely. Mm. Uh, but uh, now, yeah, it's gone a little bit chilly, a little bit overhast, mm. a little bit windy. What a way to start, though, with those white-tailed eagles. Amazing. Isn't it? Just... An amazing sight to be able to see those things. Yeah. That camera brought to us by the Latvian Fund for Nature. Yeah. And that's something that we have been following all throughout the South Island broadcast when we started all those years ago, back in my old day. What? <laughs> in my day but did you notice this morning did you notice this morning that you had sound mm, the yeah. sound of the eagles scrunching on their nest yes the Fabian Harrison has, has pulled off a miracle and we finally managed to get sound from those well I say we Fabian yeah um, thank you Fabian. Fabian the technical wizard has done has done that for us which yeah. is fantastic nice to see those birds still prospering and still in the nest yes. after another week yeah exactly they're right on the edge of that nest though aren't they which is a bit annoying mm. if they could just move a little bit to the right you know I got asked a question yesterday would I rather be able to teleport or speak to animals? And I said, well, I'll speak to animals because then you could direct them. Teleport, meaning what? You know, teleport. You know, you, you say you want to go over there and five seconds later... You were like Star Trek. Yeah, a bit like Star Trek. But of course, speak to animals. I mean, look, it would be great. Just get on the walkie-talkie. Say to these, you know, these birds, go on, off you pop. Off to the right a few inches. Yes, well, really La Latvian Fund for Nature have got some fantastic cameras worth checking out all of mm. their others. Oh, they'll be coming to an end soon, of course, as we mm. move later into the season with those birds. But nevertheless, they have been giving us fantastic... Yeah of all sorts of things, mm. goshawks. Um, this one could do with panning to the left, you're absolutely right. Yeah. But because we do have our own white-tailed eagles in the UK, Roy mm. Dennis Wildlife Foundation have reintroduced these not 20 not miles far. over there yeah. on the Isle of Wight. And mm. those birds are satellite tracked and they are flying around. And if you visit the website, you can see where they are pretty much at the moment. Yeah. And they've been roaming all over the UK. Sadly, I've not gazed into the skies above the farm here and yet, yet. seen a white-tailed eagle to put on the you know on the list on the bird list we're keeping our eyes peeled aren't we but these populations they do take quite a long time to um increase in area and that's because the breeding success is relatively low and they take quite about they're about five to six years old before they breach breeding maturity and they prefer to nest around established pairs near their natal site so of course it takes them a little bit longer to establish where to nest and to be able to breed successfully so sometimes that you know getting them over and getting them to increase their population size is a slow process which is why these translocation projects with the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation has been so so important they've been brought down to the Isle of Wight doing really well of course they were once widespread across Britain mm. but um, they nested on the Isle of they Wight they nested on the Isle of Wight they nested all round and it was an amazing sight to be able to look mm. up and see incredible eagles flying past as you have in your breakfast but I mean of course that's not so much the case anymore they were really persecuted um, and so these conservation efforts are really important to help them get back on their wings. Yeah. Is what I did there. And Roy, <laughs> Roy, Roy was involved with what the initial reintroduction um, way, way back in the 1970s mm. in the Western Isles of Scotland. And that, that took a long time to get going. But of course, we've learned a lot more uh, mm. about how to do these reintroductions since then. So we're hoping the one on the Isle of Wight will get kits started a little bit more quickly. Anyway, mm. look, we better crack on because we've got yes. a, a cracking programme today. Lots of good stuff coming up. One thing not coming up, apologies to Dave Webb and the UK mm. Wild Otter Trust for reasons that will become evident next week. We're going to cover that issue um, that we were talking to him about next week rather than this week. Mm. And also we might have some more pictures of otters by then, which would be good which as well, really which would be really good. So we've got lots coming up today. Yes, yes. So let's start off with the quiz, shall we? So every week we give you a quiz, whether it's an object or a visual, ask you to identify it. This week, this time, we are asking you to identify this sound. So have a little listen to this. Mm. very characteristic yeah. nothing else sounds like that nothing no. else sounds like that very particular to a particular habitat that we have here in the uk and as another clue i can tell you that for some considerable period of time certainly when i was a kid um the, the type of um, animal that was making that sound was considered endemic to the UK in that mm. it was only found in the UK and not found anywhere else. But the taxonomists, those people who classify animals and separate them into species or subspecies or everything else, um, have had a go at it and it's no longer endemic. 
so it's not one of mm. ours that only we have in the UK any longer. But we've got plenty coming up today. We've got Andy Rouse, mm -hmm. Photographs Under Lockdown, a beautiful film shot by Joe Cooper for a mindfulness moment. Yeah, we've all missed those. Yeah, we've got Luke Massey, uh, interesting story from Spain coming up about uh, salt and vineyards mm -hmm. and their impact on wildlife. And then we've got Badger Photograph of the Day. <laughs> we've both been photographing the badgers it's become yeah, it's been obviously become competitive obviously so you can be the judges of well you don't need to be but anyway um uh, who's <laughs> taken the best badger photograph and yes finally finally thanks to a man called Derek Warren we've got the answer to why these badgers are pale in colour and and what it's all about mm. and at about one o'clock this morning i eventually found his book a fantastic book a lifetime of mammals which i didn't own but i read online i've subsequently ordered and in it he explains pretty much precisely what's going on with the pale badgers which is pretty See, i'm so pleased i'll read it out i'm going to read it at, at, towards the end of our little broadcast yeah anyway, we'd better Great. crack on and yeah first thing is news from the nest news from the nest now of course if you remember that was one that was the name of one of the digital shows that hannah stipfel was presenting in, in Spring Watch. And um, we thought we'd kind of do a little bit of an update on those nests. Of course, we were following them throughout that four weeks. Uh, digitally, the three weeks that on the terrestrial programme, we were following lots of different characters. They grabbed our hearts and we wanted them to succeed in rearing those Some young. did. Some got them out. Some did. Some didn't do quite so well. So let's go few, uh, through a few of those nests. So, of course, we were looking at some long-eared owl, uh, long owls. And I'm really happy to say that the two chicks did successfully fledge. Yep. That's a really good one. They've been seen in the top of the tree. The mm -hmm. people that were down there monitoring at the time have been out this week. We're keeping the locations of these birds secret yep. and also therefore the names of the people. But they've been out for us this week. We asked them if they wouldn't mind popping in to have a look to see what had happened. And two of those long hour chicks were successfully sat at the top of a tree. Yes, very good news. And our kites as well. I have to say, very similar story. Two of our kite chicks also fledged and are doing really well as well. And they think that there might be a third one kicking around somewhere as well. Yes. So our firecrest nest, the nest is very much intact. It is very messy. Covered in poo. It's covered in poo. I mean, these nests, I don't know how they do it. They're just filthy, these firecrests, aren't they? But it means that they've fledged, yeah, though. It means it all does. of those youngsters yeah. got to the edge of the nest, trampled it all down and pooed mm -hmm. on it. And it wasn't torn out of the tree, which we typically see with goldcrest mm -hmm. and therefore perhaps firecrest nest if, if, if uh, predators find them. So the high, it, we can't be 100% sure, but all of the evidence leads to suggest that those firecrests successfully fledged the nest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we can't be 100% sure because all those cameras that are up for spring watch are taken down relatively soon after the, for the program so we're not keeping an eye on them as closely as we were in spring watch but it's great that we are able to go out and just monitor them and check how they're doing um so let's have a look at our little ring plovers and our sandpipers both fledged both yeah. hatched and, and and ran off goshawk as well did really well mm -hmm. goshawk, goshawk made yeah. it made it out of the nest i think again two who were seen close mm -hmm. to the nest another one heard quite close by so they did well got some more goshawk stuff coming up mm. actually towards the oh. end of this broadcast <laughs> uh, a local yeah. filmmaker manuel hinge has uh, given given us some pictures of goshawk and the eggs. Wow. It's beautiful. Wait till you see the eggs coming up a bit later on. It's fantastic yeah. news. So okay. Kingfish kingfishers, last time they were seen, they were also about to fledge. So that's good news. You know, it's been very good news so far. Isn't it's all it? good news. It's all very good news. Next up, we have got a video clip for you. This is of our uh, green finch. Have a little look at this. Here we go. You can see the green finch. So this is going back a little while now. You can see the two adults feeding the young there. Regurgitating. Regurgitating. There were five chicks. I can say that they were all ringed um, and were successfully fledged on the 22nd of, uh, of June. So they all did successfully fledge. But you can see there how attentive the adults are being mm. to those chicks. And of course, being ringed, it's a really good thing, able to collect vital data from them. They would have been ringed there. Wings would have been measured. We've got bio measurements from them that will go into a big database and allow us to understand more about the species and how it works. And of course, keep track of their movements because if those green finches are found anywhere else in the world, they've got a very unique tag on their leg that enables scientists to con contact one another, find out where that bird is from and map the movements which is really important as Particularly well. Particularly in greenfinches at the moment, as they are a species that's been suffering through this terrible disease, mm -hmm. which has been sweeping through the country. So many people have been losing their greenfinches. The more we learn about them, and the way that they uh, behave and their mm -hmm. ecology, the better it will come. And we need to uh, think about conserving mm -hmm. them. 
Our song thrushes. Well, the brood did very, very well. It was incredibly successful. And they all fledged on the 13th and 14th of June. So that's really good news there. Our SETI's warbler. Not such good news. I'm afraid not. The Jetty's Warbler's Nest failed, didn't it? Mm. Um, they basically went to the nest. Uh, there was just nothing there. Um, but it, there should have been at, at that point. So they were predated, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, we, but we've no idea you know, what it was that predated them. There were no signs around the nest to suggest any, mm. any particular type of predator, mammal, bird or other. So it's a bit of a shame Chetty's Warbler didn't make it. But the likelihood is, of course, that they failed quite early in the season. Mm. And as a consequence, they may well now be already re-nesting somewhere else. Mm. So the next one, we have another clip for you. This is of our chaffinch nest. Let's have a little look at our chaffinches. Oh, I've missed them, you know. You missed the chaffinches? Oh, I have. Look at them. Oh, sweet little These were the ones that sort of headbutted. The, they flew to the camera, didn't they? They were landing, <laughs> landing on top of the camera, actually. So I like that. Very inquisitive little things. But here we go. We can see them. 6.50. Is it going to go? And there's a fledge. Yeah. It's nice. Nice being able to watch them all go, isn't it? No doubt. But they're uh, they're still hanging around in that rough area. Of course, they're provisioned by the adults for quite some time after they leave the nest, a few weeks, a couple of weeks, about three weeks or so. So they're still in that area um, and people have been to check on them and they are still hanging around. Excellent Those stuff. youngsters. OK, what about the robins? We saw that the robins were going, didn't we? I seem to remember watching them yeah. fledge. Didn't we see the robins fledging? I feel like, do you know what? I feel like they did and we did a... It was live, wasn't it? We managed. Did we get it live? I can't. Do you know what? This it was such a fledgerthon, wasn't it? it and was they all went in a rush over that one weekend. <laughs> yeah. Dunnocks, robins, chaffinches. Mm -hmm. Here they are. They were tucked away down in that little cleft of ivy. And um, yes, look at them. I, I like a little go. robin actually. Yeah, I do. I might prefer them to the adults. Do you think? Yeah, big red. Yes, oh, no, I like that. It's, it's a bit showy. It's a bit like you, mate. Know. I know, I know, but the little scalloping on their chests when they're when they're when they're young, like that. <laughs> when they've got like you know the feathers coming out. Oh, there those is tufts. tufts! I know. Thrushes <laughs> have those. They look Chicky so robins. silly. Oh, yeah. it's great though. I feel like it just reminds me of like Back to the Future or you in the morning. <laughs> I don't understand Back to the Future, but I, I have noted my own appearance can mimic that at some stages. I actually made an effort today, by the way. Yeah, I noticed that. Actually. Yeah, I had a shave, washed that. my hair, brushed it, did all of that. Only for it's the a dogs. rarity these days, you know. Only for the dogs, only for the dogs, so that I was respectful when I took them out for their walk this morning. Yeah. Should we move on to the last of the nest that we have news of? Um, and the, we've left the worst till last. Um, great mm. crested grebes. Yeah, we all had such high hopes, of course. We saw them building a platform. Um, and we thought originally it was going to be a mating platform because it didn't look very stable. You can see the adults here. I mean, it's right in the middle of that open water, not very well supported by those reeds. I mean, they don't... Oh, and a then a bit of mating going on. So, of course, we assumed mating platform, which they do build. Um, and then they come back and have a, have a nesting platform when they're ready to lay their eggs. But much to our surprise, they did. They laid an egg on that mating platform. Uh, so it quickly became our nesting platform and um, we were a bit nervous. Yeah, I mean, they were still yeah. laying the eggs. They did lay three mm. eggs. And it was on the 16th of June we've got here that they had laid uh, three eggs. Mm. Um, we thought, didn't we, initially that they might be first time breeders. And you can see the eggs there, but also how shallow the nest is. Now, Grebe's nest can be shallow and it's OK if the eggs get wet. But typically, when you look at a great crested grebe's nest, not that I'm the world expert on great crested grebes, I've got to say, but when I have looked at nests, they've been in a bit deeper than that. You know, there's been a bit more substance to them. And we did see these birds continually adding material, but it seemed to get washed away as quickly as they put it there. Um, so I think they built a mating platform, forgot about building an actual nest because they were inexperienced, laid some eggs just to see what would happen. And unfortunately, they were washed uh, out and that nest disappeared and as a consequence the eggs were lost of course the birds are still there on the pool and the you know hope is of course that they'll nest successfully well it's going to be next year now they won't restart they breed quite yeah. early in the year um so i, I don't see them um, breeding again this year but anyway there we are that's the update for the spring watch nest which was largely yeah. good news particularly those yeah. long-eared owls that was good yeah. to see those and the kites and the goshawks mm -hmm. bad news about the great crested grebes and the chetties now 
Living yeah. alongside wildlife is something that we need to give due to consideration too, particularly as we put more and more pressure on that environment. Luke Massey is a, a filmmaker who's a friend of uh, ours who lives out in Spain, and he's been working with two groups of people there who can have a positive impact on the wildlife in their area. But of course, that positive impact can only be continued if we support them we being perhaps us, me and you, or perhaps other people in that Spanish community. And the people that we're talking about are people who harvest salt in a traditional way, and also who are, what should we say, a bit more environmentally minded when it comes to managing their vineyards. So here is a film from Luke in Spain about those two practices and the way that if they are done in a particular way, they can support some pretty spectacular wildlife. Salarte is a little NGO uh, named the Fund for the uh, Stewardship and the Recovery of the Marshland. Uh, we found it because uh, the situation of the um, marshlands and the, the salt pans in the south of Spain is absolutely dramatic. We moved uh, to create this, this project uh, to demonstrate the importance of the salt pans, the, the, the important uh, of the marshland, uh, not only for biodiversity, uh, it's uh, key to the surveillance of the people that have been uh, growing and developing their lives uh, in this Bay of Cadiz. The artisan way to salt harvesting has been done by the last 2,000 years. Uh, the wildlife have been adapted to, to this uh, situation and men and wildlife have been uh, working together for an um, improved uh, landscape as this one. The salt pans are, are key uh, for wildlife and the flyways because there is a, a transformed uh, marshland, a transformed area, but is managed by man. Uh, a lot of migrant birds, little terns, uh, black-winged stilt, uh, Kentish plover, uh, abbotset, and even uh, spoonbills uh, choose this uh, habitat uh, in their um, flyways from Africa each year to, to breed here. It's, a, it's a, a supermarket, it's a hotel, it's a stopover and it's a key habitat uh, that demonstrates that the human management can help the biodiversity uh, survive. Salarte works to reinforce the, the chain and the connection between nature, culture and food. Pues los mayores siempre cuentan que cuando vamos antes era una cantidad enorme de, de pájaros, de aves, de, tanto de los permanentes como los que van y vienen de África. Pero y ahora es que mmm, no se ven nada, nada comparado con los de antes. Y, y to, todos te dicen lo mismo, que los venenos, los venenos, los venenos. Y lo mismo que el Martín Pescador es, es símbolo de agua. Mmm, Vamos, eh, agua sana, eh, sin, sin contaminación, el arzacola en la viña representa más o menos lo mismo. El, el arzacola es un pájaro de, que siempre, siempre han contado, siempre desde que existe la viña aquí y a raíz de la, de la, del abuso, vamos, del abuso y del incremento de pesticidas ha ido decreciendo sus su números. Eh, y es un, para mí es un placer, vamos, estar trabajando y escuchar y ver el, el pajarito al lado. No solo, bueno, no, eh, hablamos de la arzacola, pero también los demás. Hay veces que también mmm, voy dejando por ahí, pues en relación a la arzacola. Nos tenemos que volver totalmente eh, orgánico, aparte, de, aparte también del de lo que es el, los tratamientos fitosanitarios, la reducción de hábitat, que se están arrancando muchas viñas. Ese es un problema grande, el, la, la, la poca rentabilidad de la viña. 
el precio de la uva. Eso es, es tan grave como lo de los pesticidas. Si, si reducimos el... Si, si quitamos viña, aquí, aquí el alzacola no, no va a volver. El, el tener el alzacola aquí es un, es un símbolo de calidad de medioambiental. Si tuviéramos una bonificación, de alguna manera, de que por, por tener el alzacola en tu viña o por tú constatar que tienes tres nidos, te da, te da una bonificación, seguramente ese, ese, ese viticultor se preocuparía más por él y, 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 y echaría menos herbicidas y sería mejor para todos. Si es buena para el pájaro, es buena para el ser humano. Eso es lo que tenemos que contar. Que no solamente, no solamente eh, es, el, es el animal, somos nosotros. Esto es una cadena y está, y está clarísimo. Nosotros estamos en esta cadena y los perjudicados no, no van a ser los, los animales, solo somos nosotros. Good stuff. Really good stuff. Thank you so much to Luke for putting that together. It just goes to show with the right management under, in these areas, it's can be a fantastic place for wildlife. All that biodiversity in that film yeah. is just astonishing. I mean, going to those places yeah. and just taking a seat down, these are kind of unexpected places with their salt pans. In the UK, graveyards are a great place, aren't they, to go for wildlife. Really cool place. It's all quiet. Um, but it's brilliant. Even the sewage works that we go sewage to. Sewage works, fantastic. Sewage works are great for wildlife and salt pans and things. They can be a thriving place for biodiversity. And productive from the human point yeah. of view. So sustaining those communities, as they have done in certainly the case of salt for thousands of years, but we do need to support them. And, mm. and that means that putting money basically in the pockets of those people. And if you're making yeah. choices about what you buy, that choice, the pound in your pocket, can be a very powerful tool when it comes to conservation. You might want to think about buying wine from organic vineyards and certainly if you're out mm -hmm. traveling if ever that becomes possible again then when you have a choice then maybe that's the choice that you should make it gives mm -hmm. us all the choice and it'd be, it's great to see those birds prospering yeah. Yeah. good stuff good stuff but when mm -hmm. it comes to birds prospering we're now getting onto our soapbox to talk about a species which unfortunately isn't prospering here in the uk mm -hmm. not attaining anywhere near the population that it should be capable of and i'm afraid that's down to our intervention in the form of persecution mm -hmm. and the species that we're talking about is the hen howia <clears throat> which without ambiguity is persecuted on driven grouse moors so that more grouse can be produced well through uh, wild justice a not-for-profit organization that i'm part of with mark avery and ruth tingay last year we launched a uh, uh, the government petition to ban driven grouse shooting which very rapidly attained more than a hundred thousand signatures which meant that it should have had a debate in parliament but understandably under the covid situation that was impossible so i was very grateful that kerry mccarthy mp um stepped in and we had a discussion about this instead of the debate. This was an alternative um, a discussion about this, which you can watch in full online. It lasts for about 40 minutes. But, I, you know, if you have any interest in, you know, UK wildlife and particularly birds, then perhaps you and you're not familiar with all mm -hmm. of the issues surrounding this, then it might serve as a, a useful introduction. Um, <clears throat> here's a little clip which is from the top where I'm speaking about the reply that the government gave to the petition once it received 10,000 signatures. Um, so here's Kerry and I having a conversation uh, about that. What did you think um, with these petitions when they get to 10,000 signatures, they get a government response in writing? What did you think of that response to this time round? Well, I, I'm going to struggle to be polite, Kerry, if I'm honest with you. Um, it, it was uh, pathetic and derisory and, 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 and encompassed. That's you trying the... to be polite, is it, Chris? <laughs> it is, yes, I'm afraid. Um, it, well, let me say it, it was enormously disappointing because oh. it showed a, a depth of ignorance and willful blindness that we didn't want or expect. And I might run through through some of the points in that reply, if I may. Mm -hmm. and they say, and one of the most emotive issues you'll understand is the relentless persecution of our birds of prey on driven grouse moors. Um, and they say that they've identified raptor persecution as a wildlife crime priority, but we've heard this for so long. And investment into solving this problem has been precious little and ineffective. They cite the raptor persecution priority delivery group, but as I'll tell you in a moment, that group is beleaguered by a surfeit of cases which have come to the fore in just the last few weeks under lockdown. 
Uh, they go on to say that they wish to work with stakeholders to try and eradicate these crimes. Well, I can assure the government that the conservation fraternity have been trying to work with those self-same stakeholders for many years um, and come up against a brick wall of ignorance and arrogance. Uh, they will not make any concessions because they can get away with it and they continue to get away with it. And until they can't get away with it any longer, I don't think we'll see any concessions in place. What is notable in the government's reply, however, is that they recognise um, that this is a very important habitat. They write here, the UK uplands have 75% of the world's remaining heather moorland and about 13% of the world's blanket bog. So there is no ambiguity in DEFRA's mind that the habitat that we're talking about here is extraordinarily valuable. Uh, they say that healthy active peat provides good habitat for grouse, well, it does when it's managed for grouse, as well as numerous environmental benefits and ecosystem services. Natural England is working with landowners of grouse moors to develop management agreements, which include vegetation management principles uh, for various habitats on grouse moors. Well, let's take a, a cold, hard look at Natural England. They've had their budget slashed to the core. They are struggling to choose what to do. Um, and a lot of the time they don't have the, the time the effort, energy or personnel or finance to conduct any of that work. And they've struggled to work with any of the stakeholders. Um, and they've frequently had their ideas and recommendations snubbed. So uh, again, I would say that this is just you know, brushing it under the carpet. It's, 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 you know, it's putting the ball in the, in the court of a beleaguered small section of the police force, which are underfunded to try and solve the crimes, which are very difficult to solve in the first place, and then saying it, this is all down to Natural England, and then pulling all the funding from Natural England and making their life difficult in every department, not just looking after driven grouse moors. Well, that's just a snippet of the conversation that we had. And throughout the course of that conversation, we weren't speaking just about hen harriers all of the time, but about the other issues that surround driven grouse shooting in the UK. So as I say, I would urge you to take a look at that if you're unfamiliar with those, or perhaps even read Mark Avery's book, Inglorious, which deals again with all of those uh, uh, issues in even greater detail. But the thing that we're focusing on is the persecution of birds of prey, and in particular hen harriers. Those that seem to suffer worst are golden eagles and hen harriers, certainly. In, in Scotland. But uh, across the rest of the UK, buzzards, kites, peregrines, they all succumb and prey to the same sort of persecution. Um, there is no ambiguity about the fact that it's taking place. We, are, we satellite track these birds now and we know that there is a greater number of them disappear on driven grouse moors than, than anywhere else. Um, and sometimes we catch people in, in, in the act, which is very hard to do given the area. But I think the thing that saddens me more than anything is that you know, there was a period of time when this sort of persecution was rife throughout, you know, from about 1830 uh, through to the early part of the last century. And it diminished the populations of many of our raptors. In fact, some of them disappeared completely. White-tailed eagles, a case in part. Goshawks, a case in part. Ospreys, a case in part. We've all worked so hard to get them back. Um, but now, since the 1980s, the levels of persecution have risen again. Um, and this was so disappointing. You know, when I was a kid, I was just thinking, this is all, this, this is all going to go. We're, we're more informed. We have a, a greater understanding of our need mm. to make sure that we have healthy, balanced ecosystems. But I'm afraid there are many areas of our uplands where you can go where you will see no predators at all, not just a lack of hen harrows, but a lack of anything else. And this is a, a travesty, uh, in, in my opinion. If people were going into our art galleries when they're open and destroying our national treasures, you know, burning down constables and, 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 and other, great, you know, turners and things like that. There'll be an enormous outcry. Um, for me, you know, the hen harrier is a great national natural treasure and we should be doing everything we can to preserve them mm. and equally persecute those who persecute them. I've never seen one in the UK. I don't think I've ever seen one. There we are. You know, and that's a scary thing to think that most people of my generation probably won't have seen one. No. You know, unless you go out specifically looking for it or you happen to live in an area where there are some. Yeah. Um, but lots of people haven't. And let alone what, you know, if I have children or their children and what their experiences with these birds of prey will be like. Are you, are you trying to tell me something? No, I'm not trying to tell you anything. No, but I'm just saying, you know, future generations... Oh. Look, look, oh, at this, look, at this on look at this one. Look at this one sky dancing. I mean, this is one of the most remarkable displays that you can see performed by any bird in the UK, the male hen harrier, a striking bird. 
um, and when they perform this sky dancing display in in springtime it's it's absolutely exhilarating to watch mm. i've only unfortunately again i've only seen that on a handful of occasions yolo williams uh, our spring watch colleague you know he cites this as possibly nature's greatest spectacle in the uk he has a long association with these birds they're part and parcel of his culture uh, and and the country where he lives and to be robbed of that is essentially uh, well wrong it, it, it's it, illegal so please join us if you can in peacefully and democratically campaigning for the end of the slaughter of these birds and reform when it comes to mm -hmm. driven grouse shooting and that reform could come in a number of ways it could come in the form of licensing those shoots um, and it could come in the form of banning them I mean how you find your own opinion is entirely up to you but if you watch that uh, little chat that Kerry and I had thanks to uh, the House of Commons Petitions Committee then you might be able to think a little bit further about that and that'd be good that's what it's all about it's yeah. about sharing our uh, concerns building our community and leading to creative mm -hmm. change that's yeah. what we want some creative change your voice is important you know it's really important to stand up and use it for nature at this point in time it's not enough now just to hear about persecution or see statistics and figures and think oh that's really awful it's really bad we can't no, no longer be in ignorance of these things no. because to be in ignorance of it to willingly be in ignorance of it it's just to turn a blind, blind eye and allow it to continue and we can't allow it to continue any longer so please do use your voice sign petitions get talking to one another start conversations up hen harrier is, co hen Harrier day is hen coming Harrier up day is coming up it's a virtual hen harrier day um, more on that is going to be coming very very soon we'll do an announcement and yeah. um yeah That'll be join us August. for that that'll, that'll be, be in great. august lots of events anyway so from our soapbox onto something a little bit more peaceful a little bit more wow it's a lovely thing, really. For, throughout Spring Watch, of course, mindfulness moments were at the top of everybody's list. Everybody loved them. They were absolutely beautiful. And I'm really happy to say that Joe Cooper has done one for us today. Joe lives near Winchester. He's a cameraman that films a lot on Panorama. Um, and he's gone out and he has... He's a brilliant filmed... cameraman. I've yeah. worked with him for a long time, actually. He's, I really, really enjoy working with Joe. He's, he's got a great sense of humour, mm -hmm. even in times of adversity. And sometimes when he's working on things like Panorama, there's some pretty serious issues. Mm -hmm. But Joe always manages to keep a, you know, a, a smile on his face, get the job done brilliantly. Mm -hmm. And he also has a keen passion for wildlife. He lives in a sort of rural location as well. Yeah. So here it is, a mindfulness moment. Take a sit back. If you've got your cup of tea or your cup of coffee, sit back, relax and enjoy.
lovely. It's just beautiful imagery and it just resets you. It grounds you back down to earth again. Mm. You know, you forget mm. about whatever's going on in your day and you can just concentrate on the beauty of nature. And I just find it really, I don't know, calming. Yeah, and also that yeah. field margin, how much life there is mm. in that one field margin. If you give space to wildlife, mm whether it's a salt pan, whether it's a vineyard, whether it's a field margin near Winchester. Mm. You know, life is so tenacious, it will take over and, and, and come back. Mm. That's what we're asking. Yeah. It's a little bit of tolerance sometimes, but that was beautiful. Thank you, Joe, very much yes. for that. We're hoping to do some more work with Joe. Yes, that'd yep. be great. He said he'd help us make some films for this, which is very kind of him. Yeah. So if we can, we'll take him up on that, given the restrictions that are still in place, of course. Mm. We've got to respect those. Okay, uh, badgers. Now, mm -hmm. during Spring Watch, we were very fortunate to be able to show you some of the badgers that we've been watching out in the New Forest National Park, which is over there by about, oh, I still think about five kilometres, something like that. And there's a set there that we have been looking at, which has some pale individuals yeah. in. We've become very fond of our badgers. Mm. We have grown to love them over this course of lockdown. We've been watching them intently, photographing them, of course, filming for Spring Watch, and trying to understand a little bit more about their biology. Yeah. Um, so when I was up there recently, a few days ago, I managed to put my phone on a tree and film a time lapse. So this gives you an idea of the number of badges that are there and a bit about their coloration too. So have a little look at this time lapse. It's a good idea this. I hadn't thought of doing yeah. the time lapse of the, of the badger set. It took a while. So what I did, you know, I put a few peanuts out there just to uh, encourage them to come out. And you can see they start coming up on that left hand side. And, uh, you know, a few individuals, you can see the pale one there coming in. And then it just explodes with badgers. It's a badger bonanza. It's a badger bonanza. It's I love a badger the word bonanza. It's my favourite word. It's an bonanza. explosion of badgers everywhere. And Look these two were one. very confident. Yeah. But it's fantastic to be able to go and get a you know a close, intimate look at these animals and understand a bit about their lives, their behaviour. It's quite interesting. I see the two cubs coming out together and they're jostling for peanuts and they're pushing each other with their bodies like that. They're just like pushing each other off. You know, and it's great because you wouldn't see that normally, and it's their interactions as individuals and how they respond depending on dominance. It's fascinating. Yeah, but really we've cool. also had the opportunity, therefore, to to photograph them as well. Um, so we've been using telephotos lying on the mm. ground. I mean, it's can't. It's not always possible. Wind is really critical when you're watching yeah. badgers. They can't get the scent of you. So sometimes when we've been up to the uh, that set, it's been impossible to do anything because the wind's in the wrong direction. But occasionally, when the mm. wind is right and there's no one else around, we've been lying down and photographing them using our telephoto lenses. And here's one of the photographs that. I've got of the uh, one of the pale adults there. Look at that. Yeah, I'm sort of quite pleased with that. Well, it's black and white, so you can't really see that it's pale though, as much. I mean, well, I know that the, but, the, you know, the most amazing thing about this set is the colour morphs that are in it, right? So we've got all the different types of, you know, leucism, we've got aesthetic badges and everything, but you've turned it black and white. You yeah, I'm into black and white. Yeah, and I know. And, and, and yeah. I like black and white, particularly for badges, because badges, they have got what that colour striking. badges, Max? Yes. I get that, but this one isn't. This individual isn't, and you're taking. Okay, let's have a look at one of Megan's pictures. Let's have a look at one of <laughs> Megan's photos. Let's have a little look at that then. Oh, you're going to tear it apart now, aren't you? <laughs> <sighs> look at that little beauty. Yeah. It's one of the cubs, isn't it? It's one of the cubs. It's an aerosthetic animal. Um, so pigmentation in mammals is produced by different forms of melanin um, two forms in particular one that produces red pigmentation and one that produces a darker pigmentation mm. and aerosthetic animals have that red tinge they're slightly kind of almost like a rose gold kind of color yeah. and that's because that red type form of melanin that red pigmentation overrides that of the dark melanin so they form this kind of beautiful coppery rose gold mm colour and it's stunning it's mm. a stunning animal mm. yeah yeah that, i've got the, uh, the unfortunate thing the most unfortunate thing is that that photograph is better than me i love the bokeh in the background i love the light on the side of the badger yeah. there i love the pose of the badger there's a little foot up look it's like posing out and he's looking at you thinking is that something over there or is that not you know oh yes it's a yeah it's a better photo than mine it's right because you can keep trying you know, you got, you got, you have a few more. Attempts. Last night, I was in, I was in bed quite late, and I was absolutely determined to get to the bottom of the uh, whole spectrum of colour in badgers. We had discussed this in Spring Watch, and I found this this book, A Lifetime of Mammals, written by uh, an author called Derek Warren. I, I knew nothing about this book; it's not in, in my library. However, I found this in it, so I'm just going to read it to you verbatim because it's, it, there were two pages. I'm not going to read all, all of it, but um, just the, the bit that, uh, that applies to leucism. So leucism is a colour variation which is sometimes confused with albinism. 
In albinism, the absence of tyranase actively prevents melanin production, whatever the origin of melanin producing cells. In contrast, leucism is caused by another recessive gene which occurs in populations of various animal species. Leucistic animals appear white, having a both a white skin and white hair, but they retain pigment coloration in the eyes. The leucistic animal does not have any black hair, and the leucistic bird has white feathers. The origins of different pigment-producing cells may still be relevant to understanding color variation, including albinism and leucism, but there are differences of opinion about this. Almost all cells which produce melanin migrate to the skin from a small raised area, the neural crest, close but separate from where the embryonic brain is developing. The exceptions are those which also originate in the embryo, but from the part which the brain and spinal cord arise from. The melanin-producing cells originating from the neural crest in the embryo are ineffective in leucism, so the skin, hair, etc. appears white. The cells which originate from the neural tube in the embryo are, are not involved, so the retina remains pigmented. An alternative argument is that in leucism, there are no pigment cells in the skin anyway, that they are present in the eye, which is not involved in the condition. Partial leucism can occur if some melanin producing cells fail to reach, for example, all of the skin, in which case there will be patches of white hair amongst the normal colored hair. The piebald, as we call them, animal would be an example of partial leucism. Well, take a look at this photograph, which I found mm. online, because this is the most extraordinary badger. This blows our badgers clean out of the water. Look at this. That's amazing, isn't it? So this is partial leucism. So it's not an aesthetic badger. It's a typically colored badger. But during its embryonic development, those cells have not migrated from its neural crest to that part of the body. Um, mm -hmm. on the, what would you say, its, well, its left-hand yeah. side of its head. And as a consequence, it lacks that black pigmented stripe there. Now, what about that? That's it's an extraordinary animal. Yeah. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? So this whole phenomena doesn't only come down to come mm -hmm. to genetics. It also comes down to embryology and how during the process of the animal's development, these recessive traits, recessive genetical traits, form in the animals mm. themselves. So it's quite complex, but not, remember, of course, we don't just see this in badgers, we see it in an, other animals which we are familiar to us. A lot of people see albino grey squirrels. Yeah. Some people see melanistic or dark red squirrels. There's a population of those in, um, in the UK. So yeah, good, it's good stuff. Finally mm. got to the bottom of the science of leucism. Finally, it's been bugging us for quite a while. Interesting stuff. It's been lying there looking at those badgers thinking, what's going on with your coats? What is going on with you? What's been going on with your coats? Yeah. Okay. So, what's next up? So next up, of course, on South by Sitting Bird Club, we love it when you send in your photos and your videos and your comments and everything. And there is some amazing stuff that you've been sending us in. And we've been so enjoying looking through every single day. So please make sure you do that. But of course, we love to show them as well. Show them to all of you. Um, this one is from a postcard from Australia. So have a little listen to this. This is the larrikeet in Australia. We thought it would give you little snippets of things abroad. Amazing, isn't it? You can't so see them very well, but you don't no. need to because it's all about the sound, isn't it? It's an extraordinary sound, sound quite yeah. alien. I mean, we have nothing in the UK that makes nothing, a sound like that. Well, we, do, we have ring neck parakeets, yes. but even they don't make a sound like that, to no. be quite honest with you. No. Yeah. So that was filmed just about two hours north of Brisbane. Um, but it's great, isn't it, just to get little snippets of what wildlife is like around the world. So all the way from Australia, Australia, some lorikeets for you there, which has been really cool. Um, we also have this video, this one saw this and it honestly made my day it was so sweet so this is almost what we've been doing taking photos of badgers badgers they don't have the best <laughs> sense of sight <laughs> just watch that again what it is feeding away sniffing on the ground as it does and 
I know. Their eyesight is, isn't, isn't great. We see no. this when we're at the set, don't we? Yeah. They, 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 it's smell is what they pick up on. You know, as long as you're still and you've got a mm. tree behind you or you're lying on the ground and you're not moving, um, badgers will yeah. struggle to see you. Um, it's really important they don't get your scent. But obviously that one didn't get the scent. <laughs> I didn't get the scent. It was sent to us by Edwin Towler. Yeah, Edwin thank Towler. you, Edwin. But I had a badger bump. I hope you got the shot. That's the <laughs> only thing. <laughs> I hope he got the picture of the badger before it bumped into his camera. Um, so next up, we have this video, um, which is of some kestrel chicks. This was sent in to us by Mick Staines. Let's have a little look at some kestrels. Oh, I love oh, look at that. They are gorgeous. beautiful animals, that dappled kind of chestnut colour, and you can hear them as well. Gorgeous, aren't they? They're very noisy, you know. Yeah, yeah, very at, noisy. Yeah, at that stage, they're constant. Well, they're in competition for food, and yeah. the adults are coming back with, say, a single item of food. That, uh, a vole and at that stage they just give it to the youngsters so it's mm. whoever gets it eats it basically yeah. so they do clamour for that I'm very pleased to say as well we can show you some extraordinary pictures now that have been given to us by Manuel Hinge who's a, a filmmaker living here in the New Forest a man I've known for many many years he's a brilliant naturalist actually and done loads of work with badgers mm. really really good on his badgers however he sent us this stuff of goshawks so this is a, a goshawks nest from last year look at this in April the 17th Look at that. Mm. Look at the colour of those eggs. Just, Pale blue. Like, they just shine, don't they? They're just... Gosh. They look like some kind of 90s sweets. Do you oh. know what I mean? Those, like, those palmer violets, don't they? They just shine like that. That's a beautiful colour. I'm not sure about the ornithological credibility of no. comparing goshawk eggs to palmer violets, really. But, but yeah, I know, no, but I know, I know what shine, you mean. That kind of dusty shine of that but Look, here's the, the females, you know, obviously <laughs> incubating. You can see all that green material that we see them bringing into the nest there. Yeah. Um, and this is extraordinary. I think it's a sparrowhawk flies into the nest, thinks, oh my goodness. And then, yeah, that's a mistake, a big, big mistake. And uh, the female goshawk gets off of the nest once she's ha happy that those eggs are secure and uh, gives chase. But there you can see the eggs have changed Amazing. color as well. So quite clearly they start when they're freshly laid as blue. Oh, I have heard this before. And then they turn to white. The male comes in here and uh, has a little go at incubation and you can see the definite uh, size difference I think between them and of course look at the size of the nest up to a meter across this one's up in a, uh, a, a conifer tree there we are. Look at that. How tiny is he? He looks tiny. Well, well yeah, we so wouldn't say that if you saw them. No. It's only when the female pops yeah. up and you see them both together. Yeah. He's a, a lot, a bit more clumsy when he comes in to get onto those eggs as well, because um, they do spend less time incubating them. But mm. he feels compelled to give it a go. Um, doesn't last for very long. Pretty much as soon as he's settled, um, female comes back in and says, hey, come on, get out. That's my job. And he's not going to argue. Um, they can be quite aggressive between the male and the female at certain times, to be quite honest with you. Mm. But beautiful to see this. And to think that, you know, again, you know, I, I carp on, 59 years old. Um, you know, goshawks were, you know, persecuted to extinction in the early part of the last century. They've come back into the UK through escaped falconers' birds and birds which have naturally colonised from the uh, from the continent. And um, several hotspots, South Wales, there's quite a mm. lot. Kilda Forest, quite a lot. Around the New Forest here, we have quite a few of these birds breeding successfully. And they're a very cosmopolitan uh, predator. They can feed on all sorts of things. In other parts of Europe, of course, where they successfully uh, breed um, and spread out more quickly, they're, they're breeding in, in, in urban centres. Like I've heard that in Berlin there were 19 breeding pairs of Berlin, uh, you know, gossel in metropolitan Berlin feeding on squirrels and pigeons. So there is no reason really why they couldn't occur in London if they, those youngsters that are produced every year could just get there. And um, you saw them hatching there in their first white down coat. Oh, they're beautiful. Oh, they're such special birds. I mean, they yeah. really, really are just remarkable. Uh, Manuel, thanks ever so much for, for, for you know, letting us show that pic, those pictures. It was yeah. brilliant stuff. Absolutely. Blue eggs. Oh, they're so stunning, aren't they? Oh, that's good, gorgeous isn't it? Colour. That's good. What else we got? Well, next up, we have another clip of something quite interesting. Um, this is of at our Wakefield Peregrine site, but it's not exactly what you might think. No. So let's have a little look Brace at yourself. who's visiting. Uh, oh no, you know look, what's going to happen. A pigeon has gone to the a peregrine's pigeon. nesting platform. It's poking around looking for... Oh. Oh, you know it's going to end in disaster. What was the pigeon what was thinking? thinking? Does that, I mean, you know, a pigeon getting a bit nosy there, thought it was a bit brave, thought it would pluck up the courage to go 
and have a you know a scout around at a peregrine's nest. Mm-mm. Not good. No, no, no. Not good at all. Not good at all. Okay. Ferocious predators there. Okay. Now, Interesting predation. Coming up now is probably the most, you know, the best thing that I've seen on social media, certainly this week. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, when I was a kid, I had enormous fascination for grass snakes. I'd go out catching them the whole time. I've got notebooks full of the length of the grass snake, where I caught it, which sex it was. I mean, I, I just love grass snakes. They're one of my favourite animals. And I remember catching my first one in a pond in the New Forest. And I was standing on the edge of the pond. I'd been taken out by my parents on a uh, Sunday afternoon. And this grass snake started to swim by. And spontaneously, I just launched myself into the pond. I don't even remember, there was no thought process. It was just like snake, jump, and, and I caught it and I had it in my hand and I got out of the pond and I could barely speak, I was so excited. So imagine how I felt when I saw this clip this week of this young man encountering his grass snakes for the first time. And then we came back and I saw a grass snake tail and I thought I videoed it, but I, um, but I didn't, so I was quite upset. But then, um, but then I saw a grass snake um, bathe, sunbathing, took a picture, it was in focus, and then I saw another grass snake, couldn't take a picture of that one, but then I saw a grass snake on my own, molting, with, with its head, and I saw the band, and then I picked up its um, shredded skin, and then I saw the skeleton of one. <laughs> That's cool. He saw it shedding the skin, got the skin, and then he found a skeleton. He's I don't got, have he's a got the mementos I know. from that, you know, I know. That's, a, that's a memory like you that he will remember for the rest of his life. But he's got a skin and a skeleton to show as well. I've got a skin, but I don't Great. have a skeleton. I'm slightly envious, I've got to say, you know, I, I don't <laughs> have a grass snake uh, skeleton. That's amazing, absolutely. But the Great excitement, thing. the excitement. You know, Mighty Moth Girl was the uh, was the person that posted that, and you can find it on Twitter if you want to rewatch and re-enjoy that moment. I mean, as yeah. you say, that's a sort of a one of those um, formative moments you're never going to forget. It will seal a li- seal a lifetime passion mm. for grass snakes and wildlife. Fantastic mm. stuff. So, of course, South High Setting Bird Club has been a fantastic place and you've all been very kind posting your comments about what it's meant to you. And yesterday there was a comment that was posted by Gillio Ballybay and it was her birthday and she said that she had been properly SIBC'd. And I quite like that. It's my birthday, I usually get Prosecco, chocolate and pretty things. Today I got a window bird feeder and I'm over the moon. What have you done to me, group? Well, I think it's pretty good. Yeah. It's pretty good. The Prosecco is just a, a moment of fizz that might give you a headache later, but your bird feeder stuck on the window is going to give you endless joy. Mm-hmm. Endless joy. Yeah. Oh, well, you could still get some Prosecco. Oh, absolutely. And sip it whilst watching the birds oh, on your I'd feeder. I'd recommend, that, yeah. that's, that's, that's a proper birthday. That's the thing to do. Come on. And the birds are the pretty still things. Scope, still scope for that. Listen, I've just got to chuck this in. I'm very pleased to say that the uh, the lovely eggs have got a new single that's just been released. Look at Long that. stem carnations. <laughs> Long stem carnations. It's not that I'm here to plug their uh, single. It's just that their son has done a drawing for us here. Um, and you've got to look at the video. Arlo has done this little drawing. Yeah, oh, so and there were birds, look, you know, feeding things in the nest there. Uh, he's a great fan. Look at this one here. There's another bird down in the corner here. We love all of that artwork. Fish swimming in the river. And look, my favourite bit of all, bit at the bottom is a crayfish. A crayfish alongside the river. I love the detail that young people manage to get into their drawings. So yeah. if you do have any young people who are drawing, then do send their uh, pictures. But perhaps we could do a little gallery of those. Yeah, I'd like next to do week or gallery. something. So, yeah. That would be good. Send us some photos if you've got a wildlife task for you over the week to get out and draw some wildlife. Get your kids involved. And in of, of course, you can get into the lovely eggs. I thoroughly recommend them. Two piece from <laughs> Lancashire. Absolutely, they're brilliant. Yeah. You know, they are absolutely brilliant. And not only are they brilliant, they're really nice people. Mm. Brilliant, really, really nice people. Mm. Top stuff. So, Andy Rouse has been uh, contributing to the South Isolating Bird Club. He's a photographer, well known for photographing things like tigers and elephants mm. and polar bears, the stupendous pictures. Wild Man Rouse is his tag. You can find him on Instagram, of course, and on social media, uh, other parts of social media. He's got a brilliant website as well. Uh, before we get into all of that, though, take a look at this film that he's made this week. Like everyone else, he's been locked down. He hasn't been traveling to exotic parts of the world to photograph those big things. He's been uh, working much closer to his home, and it's transformed the way that he's been taking photos and also thinking about wildlife and he's got some cracking images as ever. 
Hi Megan, hi Chris. It seems ages since we last spoke and Barry Manilow, Chris, is now in the charts. I bet you can't believe your luck with that single. Now, for the past couple of months since I last spoke to you, I've been working very hard on the farm here, trying to get to grips of lots of the local species. And over the next four minutes, I wanna show you some of the really cool stuff I've been doing, because it's been absolutely epic. It's been brilliant for my mental health to just immerse myself in the wonderful wildlife that's here. And also the challenge of being a wildlife photographer and trying to outwit them enough to get pictures. So let's have a look at what I got, starting with, Flowers, Andy Rouse, flowers indeed. Now on the farm here, there are lots and lots of wildflowers in the meadows. And before they cut for silage, it was just absolutely incredible. One of the fields was covered in dandelions. You might not think that dandelions are beautiful, but I tell you what, against the setting sun, there are a few plants that are as magical as the dandelion. I like to call them geodesic shapes. It's not even a word that's in any dictionary, but I've invented it. So Wild Man Rouse has invented the word geodesic. Um, they're beautiful against the setting sun, and I liked nothing more than getting down and dirty in the grass, getting them backlit, waiting for the sun to sink in the horizon, and taking some magical shots. It was really, really awesome. And of course, it helped me find lots and lots of insects. What do you mean, Andy Rouse photographing insects? You're a big animal photographer. Well, I do flowers now. I do dandelions. So why not insects? Andy Rouse and bugs? That's right, I love macro stuff now. I've taught myself macro over the past couple of months for having no skill or knowledge whatsoever. It was actually the mason bees that really got me into it. Well, since then, I've been doing lots of backlit stuff of the bees in this very field where I'm sitting now. It's been really magical to do it. During the day, I've been doing front lit pictures of the bees, getting down in the dirt, following them from uh, flower to flower when they were feeding on the buttercups. It was really, really magical. And when I did that, I began to find a whole new world. I began to find leaf beetles and weevils and stuff like that, things I'd never even photographed. Even the dung fly, I found some magical oh, colors in it. It was just incredible. But one morning on the river, it really changed my whole perception of what I was doing because I fell in love with the damozel, these amazing damselflies, electric blue, uh, you've seen them flying around. They're just incredible, and I love them. Well, I set myself a challenge, as I always do. You should always set yourself challenges of trying to get them in flight because they're really, really stunning in flight. And I got some absolutely amazing stuff. I couldn't believe it. Absolutely got, well, I didn't get loads. I got about four um, with a few days of trying. But that's the good thing about, you know, digital and using mirrorless. You can try, try, try. And if it's no good, well, you delete it all, you learn, and then you try again and again. And I managed to get some really cool stuff, but some really cool backlit stuff as well that I know particularly Chris will love. So you got to love your damselflies, and I certainly do. I'm going to take a long time getting home like this, aren't I? Oh, does my bum look big in this?
Andy Rouse shooting insects. Who'd have thought? Andy it? Rouse bugs. Flowers. Andy Rouse flowers. Oh, I don't what? know. What? Well, they say people will talk. People will talk. People are talking, Andy. But they are talking. They're saying they're great photos, <laughs> they and that's the key thing. I mean, they're absolutely beautiful. So do visit Andy's website, um, where he's producing some prints of those damselflies, mm. which you can purchase for a small amount of money. Ideal birthday present to have alongside your prosecco and your bird feeder, which yes. would be good. So Andy is running webinars, which are well worth joining because the key thing about Andy is very good at his practical tips on how mm. to do things. So do follow him on social media wild man rouse prints are available and try and catch up with some of those webinars he also does a thing called wild angle which mm. is a film that he makes uh, a little sort of cameo again it's sort of in a place with a species how to think about it how to do it lots of top practical advice mm. it's really good and technically andy's really a wizard if yeah. i ever have te- you know any sort of technical issues with my camera frequently i do because i've never read a manual in my life i just <laughs> ring andy up and he's always he always knows the uh, answers. he's really good more from andy next week which can be really really good got mm. any uh, got any birthdays or anything do you know what it's everybody's birthday today is it it's everyone's birthday happy birthday everyone no so raymond taylor happy birthday to you joe o'hanlon happy birthday to you irene digwell you're 96 years old today very wow. special day to you happy, happy birthday. birthday that's an amazing thing hope you have a fantastic day and the sun is shining wherever you are around the uk or perhaps further afield um the secret birder's son i'm not sure your name but you're 13 today happy birthday to you start of your teenage years uh we've got jane rate is 50 on tuesday um this one i really love uh it's my son's birthday next week jonah will be eight years old he loves nature the last few months spring watch has become his second favorite program hey. after spongebob what's, what's that <laughs> i love Spon- it's, it's a sponge that lives under the sea he lives in a pineapple under We're the sea. We're coming second to a sponge that lives under the sea. Under a pineapple under the sea. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> Helen is uh, uh, Helen's daughter is 11 today. Ray Patterson, 61 today. Very, very special birthday to you. Um, and one more as well. Christina uh, Pav- Pavasi. Sorry if I get your pronunciation wrong. Um, you and your sister turn 52 tomorrow. So happy birthday to all of you. Hope you enjoy your day. And um, yeah, and just have a great time. Under the sea. Under the sea. Under, under a pineapple. pineapple. Under, under the pineapple. Sea. Yeah. Okay. What about the quiz? Did anyone get the quiz right? We had the, the quiz. quiz at the start of the program. It, it was a bird sound. Mm. Who got it right? Who got it right? Lots of people got it right. Did so they? on Facebook, we've got Zoe, Tony, John, Brenda, Carol, Gary, Andrea. Um, lots more there as well. Twitter, we've got Michelle, Alan, Liz, Janet, Peter, Colin. YouTube, uh, Simon, Vivian, Wonder, Thunderbird, Colin, and Karen. So well done to everyone who got that. Correct. And here is the sound and the, the bird that makes it. The red grouse, the mm-hmm. red grouse. Top of the course because we were talking about driven grouse shooting and hen harrier persecution earlier. And I did say that this was formerly thought to be an endemic species. We thought that the red grouse was a species mm. that you only found in the UK and nowhere else. We were wrong. The taxonomist got in there, checked out the DNA and found it was a form of willow grouse, which you also find in Europe. But if you can get up mm. onto the moors and hear those grouse calling, it's uh, quite mm. a spectacular thing. Good stuff, isn't it? Good really stuff. good stuff what yeah else? really good stuff so coming up today mm. at 6 15 p.m you can catch lindsay chapman on radio or sunday sorry on sunday at 6 15 you can catch lindsay chapman on radio 4 she is there to talk lots of different things pick of the week it's going to be really good stuff isn't it we've loved lindsay having her on sibc so you can catch up with her 6.15 on Sunday. And critically, try and engage this week. It's Swift Awareness mm. Week this week. Swift Awareness Week. Our Swifts need awareness because they're in trouble. Um, very, very, I mean, they're extraordinary birds. Oh. Don't get me going on Swifts. We'll be here for another hour. Um, <laughs> they're, they're, they're absolutely brilliant. So, again, check out social media because there's a lot of people saying a lot of things which are interesting about Swifts this week. How mm. to conserve them, where to find them. Oh, look at those Swift boxes. And how to put we boxes We love up. that. Swift boxes up in houses is a fantastic thing to do. So have a bit Swift of research quicks. into that. can be built into yes. new houses they just they, you can integrate them into the building all new houses should be having swift bricks in them it's an absolute no-brainer mm. and you can find out about where to get those swift bricks who's making them where they're being used all that sort of stuff swift yeah. awareness week try and engage with them. fantastic hen harrier day we mentioned mm. it earlier people are saying when is it well 18th of july in wales they're having a hen harrier day but we're doing a virtual hen harrier day on the 8th of august the whole day is going to be given over to all sorts of arts music 
conservation, discussion, mm -hmm. procrastination, a bit of campaigning, of course, running throughout that. It's going to be organised by Ruth PC, yeah, who's a, a colleague of ours, um, who and we'll make sure that's a, an absolutely mm. brilliant thing. It's so be an amazing yeah, event. Details really to follow about Hen Harrier Day yeah. on the. I Oh, yes, we forgot a birthday we last did. week. We did. Very sorry. Maria Docker, 60 last week. Happy birthday to you, Maria. Sorry about that. We hope you had a fantastic day and are enjoying your first week out of 60. Okay, and just to conclude, um, a running theme, but... Yes, the mice, the mice go on. This is a Longworth small mammal trap. And as you can see, the door is closed. I set it in my wardrobe last mm -hmm. night. Um, there is a, I can smell a mouse in there and it's about to be released in the woods, not <coughs> back into the wardrobe, I have to say. I just can't, Hi. you know. Yeah, no, and there's nothing I can do. I, I did tell him. Yeah. No, I know, I know, I I know. Okay, all right, I'll what pass on the message. What is it? All right, thanks. What is it? It's the Institute for Film Composers and Good Humming. Steven Still Spielberg is suing you. <laughs> no. He's suing well, you. getting the Jaws music wrong. For that Jaws theme tune. I'll tell you what. I'll You're being you sued, you know, for everything you've got. Because honestly, that was just horrific. What I'm worried about, the Jaws of these mice chewing up all my clothes again. Dear honestly, me. honestly. I'm, anyway. I'm worried about your rendition of Jaws. I mean, you need to watch that film. You need to get better at that. Okay, I'm going to I'll gen up on Jaws. <laughs> I'm not going to be here next week, though. No. It's no. just over to you, isn't over it? Over to me. I'll be here all by my lonesome. Um, oh, but we'll have some fantastic wildlife content for you. Um, some amazing people. We might talk a little bit more about science and women in science and things like that. So, yeah, mm. make sure that you tune in to that next Friday at 9 a.m. Poodles will be in it. Oh, poodles will be in it. Yes, yeah. I won't be uh, totally medium, myself. Poodles, and I might even have some giant rabbits. And some mice. And maybe mice. Okay. But, but no theme tunes. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. I think we better wrap it we up. We better wrap it up. Yeah, we got yeah. things to do, places to go, mice to release. We better get out of there pretty quickly. Okay. Oh, and then Poodles to bark at. Yeah, that's the alarm. The poodle alarm's gone off. Clearly, it's the end. Okay. <laughs> See you next week. Well, Bye, everyone. Bye.